Happy Friday, everyone. Hello, it's me. It's BJ Morgan from the Museum of Making Music. It is the last Friday in September 2020. Hello. Hey, Brian Donaldson. Hi, Mom. Thank you for saying that. That's appreciated. Um, Brian's with us every week here, one of our viewers on YouTube. And I'm coming to you again from my home here in Temecula while the Museum of Making Music is undergoing a massive renovation. Uh, I just visited there uh, yesterday due to do a, a quick walkthrough, and it looks completely different. It is amazing. I can't wait to share it with you guys. We can't wait to welcome you back as, a, as our entire staff is just excited about this entire project. Speaking of excitement, uh, very excited today to uh, talk with Dr. Molly Miller. And I, I'm, I apologize to, to Dr. Miller this morning when we did our test run that, uh, you know, every all of our guests are just so wonderful, but I, I'm not familiar with like most of them. And then as soon as she signed on board for this to volunteer to her time, I started doing some more research and just it her credits are just so amazing. She's the chair of the guitar department at the LA College of Music. She's toured with Jason Mraz. She's worked with the Black Eyed Peas. She has her own trio. She's just, her career is amazing. And so today we have Dr. Jonathan Piper, our very own artifacts and collections manager, to talk with Dr. Molly Miller on today's episode of Mom at Home. Are you guys ready? Let's do it. Ready. Welcome, Dr. Molly Miller. Thank Hi. you for being here with Mom at Home. Dr. Jonathan, you guys... Take it away. Have fun today. All right. Thanks so much, BJ. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for, for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I ho hope it's okay if I drop the uh, the formalities and just go with Molly. Oh, yeah. I like almost never go by doctor. I actually pretty much never, but for some reason lately, I, people have been calling me like Dr. Molly, Dr. Molly Miller. And it's fun, but yeah, mm -hmm. Molly is okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I have a, the title is so bizarre to me, but. Right. But anyway, that's a whole other topic. Yeah. Um, so lots to talk about today. Obviously, your career as a performer, your career as an educator, how the heck you maintain careers as both. Um, but if we can just start with your guitar player, how did you get into the guitar? What was the moment where it clicked and you just thought, I am going to play the guitar? Yeah. Um, so I've been playing guitar since I was seven years old. I'm one of five kids. I'm the middle. And so when we were ages like four to 11, um, my parents, well, mostly my dad, but he was like, we're going to start a family band. All you kids are going to oh, no. play music together. <laughs> and it was kind of like, I think of it like Selena. I don't know if you've seen that movie where like the dad like takes uh, in a van, there's like a bunch of instruments. He's like, you're this, you're this, you're that. And I was like, he's like, you're playing guitar. And at first I was playing his guitar, which is like a telly that was so heavy. Um, and I was like, okay, sure, whatever. And then like every single day we had band practice with the five kids and we were so bad, um, but we got better. <laughs> I'm like, but yeah, we re I recently found some old home videos and I was like, wow. Um, but yeah, from there, it just, I got more and more into it and more serious about it. And actually the real like aha moment, and I always feel so silly. Like I didn't think guitar was that cool. I didn't think anything of it. It was just like, this is just something I do, whatever. I want to go hang out with my friends. And then I was 13 and I learned Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix. And I was like, oh, guitar's cool. Like I had no idea until then. And then a few years later, when I was at Berkeley College of Music studying there over the summer, that was like a big aha moment where I was like, oh, this is like the only thing I can do with my life. Just being mm. around only musicians. Um, I just, I was like, this is it. So then I spent a lot of time really focused on, I knew I wanted to study guitar in college and I knew I wanted to go to a college where I could not just study music. So it was like a conservatory with a liberal arts education. So went to USC and I was there for a really long time and that's where I became a doctor mm. and learned wow. how to play guitar. <laughs> Very cool. I mean, it's, it's really interesting that you you know, I think a lot of kids can tend to run away from what their family, you know, had them do. But the fact that your family had you playing the guitar is like they were setting you up to be the cool kid. Yeah, the funny thing, the youngest of the five, um, she's a, a real doctor, a medical doctor. And she, a was real like, doctor. <laughs> she was like running away. She was like, I'm not doing this. I'm going to soccer and becoming a doctor and not having anything to do with this nonsense. <laughs> Because, <laughs> yeah, like right now, um, of the five kids, two of us became professional musicians. So my younger brother and I play music together a ton, especially mm -hmm. over quarantine. But I play in his band. He'll play with me. Uh, we do just stuff together. So, yeah, the two of us are are stuck with it. We did this crazy thing. 
I see. I, I've seen a couple of videos that you do with you, it, Sammy, right? Yeah, Sammy Miller. Sammy Miller and the Congregation yeah. is the band, and I get to play with those boys, and they're all like family I and really, actual family. Right. Uh, so, what was the rest of the instrumentation from the family band? Yeah. So my oldest brother played bass, and he he still plays bass like recreationally. You know, he'll have, he has like an upright bass at home that'll mess around with, and we occasionally play. My older sister played sax and keys. She did play sax in her uh, like law school jazz band, so it's still like somewhat in her life. And her husband has like sent us some videos of her playing old songs we used to play as children. Then I played guitar. My little brother's a drummer, and my little sister she didn't really do anything. She kind of just like sang and danced, and like we'd give her a guitar unplugged or like a shaker with nothing in it you know? so I don't blame her for rejecting music because I do understand why she would yeah wow hmm. have you ever considered uh, releasing any of those old home videos um there's a, there are communities out there who really appreciate that kind of stuff I totally would um some yeah I I feel like they need to be clipped because we I found some of our 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 band practice before our first show um and that was really comical hearing like my parents critique us and me i was like the <laughs> worst in the band like i was the one who was always like pretended like i like didn't feel well or had to go to the bathroom and just like wouldn't make band practice my punishment was practicing guitar until i was 14 and then they couldn't get the guitar out of my hands wow. it was this like shift but yeah i was not into it hmm. um and there are videos of my parents being like molly you need to stop sucking <laughs> you know <laughs> Jeez, wow wow but not in like a Joe Jackson way. In mm -hmm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. So what was your education on the guitar like? Did you have teachers, mm -hmm. you know, from the beginning or how did that all work out for you? Yeah, I feel really fortunate. So I had guitar teachers and like the, the guitar teacher would often function as also the family band teacher. So they'd like come to the house and we'd like do a family band practice. And I'd also have a guitar lesson. Um, and yeah, we had, I grew up down in the South Bay, down in um, Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. we had some people down there who helped us out. And then, um, wait, oh yeah. And then when I was like, I was like, what was my train of thought? I, I start. I feel like when I got, I got way more serious about the guitar when I was like 14, 15. And at that point, my brother was at UCLA. So, go Bruins, right? That's Bruins. all for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there he had like met Steve Cotter because he was like subbing for one of his ensembles. And uh, he didn't study jazz. He just took some jazz classes there. And he connected me with Steve Cotter. And that's like, I feel like once I started working with Steve and I was studying jazz, I just got way more serious about the guitar. And he helped me prepare for my auditions. USC was like my number one dream school. I wanted to study with all the fabulous faculty that's there and still is there. Um, so yeah, I just got way more and way deeper into it and more serious about practicing. And then at USC, of course, yeah, I was at a, a conservatory studying guitar and got mm. to work with the wonderful USC guitar faculty. Um, how did you get into jazz specifically? Was that always there or was there a moment where you sort of got just, it clicked? Um, it was like, I feel like it's the natural progression. You, like mm. I played in at the same time while I was like, I was, you know, I played guitar and there weren't like that many, I mean, I guess, I mean, there were, but like, I was one of the more serious, like guitar players when I was like 10 or 12, you know, it was like, <laughs> so I would like play in like rock bands with my friends and stuff too. So that was like one outlet. I'd be like playing like Blink-182 or like some original rock band songs. Um, and then at, simultaneously, like would do it in school and in school, the options were like concert band or jazz band. And so I just always played jazz band in school. And from there, I think what my brother really helped as well, because my brother is like, I'm a jazz guitar, I play jazz guitar, I but I don't think of myself as like a jazz guitar player. Mm -hmm. But my brother, like he studied jazz at Juilliard. He's like, was winning a one spotlight award when he was a kid. He was like really deep into it. And mm -hmm. so having him there, I think was a big part of that too. While I like was already getting into jazz and getting exposed to all these great players um, from teachers, you know, like, like Steve, you know, I was checking out Grant Green and Wes Montgomery. So it was, I felt lucky to be around people who were exposing it to me. And I just feel like it is the natural progression. If, especially at that time, I feel like now in education, there is more of an emphasis on contemporary and pop music, especially like I see it now that I'm on the other side. It's like, oh, do rock band. But that wasn't an option in an academic setting when I was a mm -hmm. kid. So, yeah. Hmm. yeah. I feel like it, it, it could be now, um, you know, some some of our audience might know I my uh, musicology doctorate was all in heavy metal studies, so I got oh, to write cool. a dissertation on on doom metal, 
Um, so, you know, these <laughs> days, who knows? Um, but yeah, totally understandable. Um, what was the first gig that you, a- away from the family band, maybe, uh, the first gig where you were sort of out on your own a little bit? Oh, it's uh, actually I have this uh, fifth grade. I remember I like the the like boy band that was it, like the boy cool rock band that I like they're all my friends in like uh, fifth grade. Yeah, they asked me to play a gig and I remember I was stoked and my dad went and I think he was like <laughs> excited that I wasn't just playing in like the elementary school jazz band or with my family. But I remember, yeah, it's like such a vivid memory of like us picking up Mexican food and I could like tell he was like proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Blink-182, a lot of Blink-182 songs wow. when I was 12 cool. or 11, <laughs> however old I was in fifth grade 11, yeah. And and what was the first gig where you, you were sort of in that moving into the jazz idiom? I worked with this organization when I was in uh, growing up called Freedom For You and their nonprofit. And I actually, I worked with them from the time I was like 16 or 15, I don't even know, till I was like probably 25 and still like recommend, now I recommend my students to them. But they do a lot of outreach and and I would do, I feel like that was a, a big organization I worked with and he would hire me for like jazz gigs locally. It's like, hey, we need a trio or a quartet. Can you put like a band together? And I was like, me? And it was like so exciting to have a gig. So that kind of period stands out, but there's not like one gig that stands out. Mm. It's like, now I'm playing jazz. I was really fortunate. I think, you know, growing up in LA and then going to USC, it kind of like naturally segued where I was had a community of people who were asking me to play. Um, and I got to, you know, ask people to play. Mm. So is that how you got, you know, connected to the likes of Jason Mraz, Black Eyed Peas, was it just sort of through the network? Yeah, it's. I always say this, like thinking about everything I'm excited about doing has come from my community, whether it is like Black Eyed Peas, playing with Jason, my job at LACM, all of it's just like, it wasn't like I was like, okay, I'm gonna play with that guy and go to some audition. It was nothing I've done that I, I love with some audition. It all happened really organically from my community. Um, and so that's what, like I always tell my students is like, like surrounding yourself with people that uh, you can build a community with. And I remember actually uh, like some, cause you can either be that person where you're like creating a community or join a community. Um, but yeah, everything I've ever done I loved has been like, I play a show with a friend and then someone sees me or that, that other person on the gig asked me this or like, my job at LACM, Adam Levy was a clinician when I was 19 years old at USC. And I was like, I love the way he plays and I asked him for a lesson. From there, we became friends, you know, for a while I would study with him. And then we just became friends would like get coffee and talk. Hmm. And then when I finished my DMA, he was the chair of LACM, Los Angeles College of Music. And I texted him being like, hey, if you ever need a sub or like I have a class you need to fill, like I'd love to teach. And he was like, great, you have two classes. It starts in a couple months. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know? And it wasn't like I was like, oh, I want to like be friends with Adam so he'll get me a job at a college, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, before we get too far into that side of things, I was wondering if you might, you know, um, be willing to entertain us with a, just a little bit of music. I don't want to totally put you on the spot. Yeah. Um, if you need a second to think about it, you know, um, just love to hear something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me, yeah, I'll play something. Um, let me think what, uh, I just hadn't decided what I was going to play yet, but. Um... Okay. Maybe some, that... some Blink-182. <laughs> Oh my god i don't even know if i remember any of it i'll play um i and I, I this should be fine i haven't played it yet today but i don't think is the volume okay great the volume's great okay this is an etude that i wrote over a guitar etude i wrote over um quarantine <laughs> Thank you. 
on it but I, oh. I didn't plug in my bat, my pedal board but yeah that was beautiful thank you wow. so much yeah thank you um and for anybody you know watching along who's, who's curious can you tell us about the instrument that you're playing yeah so this is something i got when i was 17. this was like i just came back from berkeley college of music at the time i was playing a black strat um it's so silly. I feel like I'm talking about Blink-182 too much. It's not like they were this like profound part of my life. But I kind of sounds know. like it. I know, I was like, but I did because they played strats. Um, and then I, um, I was like, okay, I want to get deeper into jazz. I was 16. Yeah, I was 16. And I was like, I want to get deeper into jazz. And um, I got, wait, actually, no, now I'm mixing story. I'm mixing times. But after I came back from a summer program and I was like way deeper into jazz guitar and we went to the local guitar shop, uh, Rhythm and Notes, which was where my one of my teachers, Mark Fichette worked as well. And I, and I got this guitar. It's a 1978 Gibson ES335. Um, I've, I love, it's like a, my limb. This baby, I like, I get scared because I get too attached to, to this guitar. I play a lot of other instruments. You know, there's a couple behind me. I play a telly a ton. Uh, yeah, the telly and this are kind of my main two ones now. But this was like my baby for mm. so long. And it still is. But I I, tr I like hate being so emotionally attached to one instrument. But right, I knew, right before quarantine, it was my last gig before quarantine. It was March 11th and I dropped this guitar. It was so oh, weird. No. Right on the um, tuning knob. Do you see how I have that one weird tuning knob, yeah. my high G yeah. string? Yeah, yeah. And it fell right there. And I was like, uh, the world's ending. I dropped uh, my child. <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. It's okay now. There's there's a little part of me that's jealous of guitarists because as a drummer, I, I only have... I only give myself the opportunity to own like one drum kit at a time just because they're so massive. But, you know, I see like all the bassists and guitarists that I'm familiar with, like, yeah, I have this guitar and this guitar and this guitar. When you select an instrument, what, what, what are you looking for personally? Like when you're choosing a guitar, I mean, obviously that one has, has, has some longevity with you too. So, I mean, that yeah. makes sense that it has a really personal connection to you, but like when you're seeking out an instrument, an additional instrument, what do you look for in that instrument? Yeah, playability is a huge thing. So is it just like easy to play, which has to do with the feel of the neck? I like smaller necks. I don't have that big of hands, but also I just feel like it's easier to play. Um, and then I don't like too heavy of guitars. And of mm. course, look, we're all we're all shallow. We want our instruments to look good. We're wearing them. <laughs> um, and vibe. I do tend to find that guitars that have been played for like hundreds and thousands of hours there's something about them they've just been like broken in a little bit they feel better to me i have played new instruments that feel incredible but um yeah i feel like they need to have some personality but at the same time you can like your personality can be with it um grow with it if that makes sense but yeah like playability and lightness and vibe and look are, are big ones I've heard the expression shared. Um, one of our, our our base mentors at the museum for our older adult uh, orchestra, he he often says that the instrument is forgetting that it's in, an instrument and it tries to go back to its original tree descendancy. So I can I I understand where you're coming from, like that you appreciate the guitars that have been played and and they know their they know their guitars. They come from you know so long from being a tree or the natural products that they once were that. That's yeah. but that's funny. I've never heard that being echoed elsewhere other than <laughs> other than uh, Bert. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Oh no, it's such a thing. I feel like a guitar needs to be worn in. Like it's like even I don't know if you can see, but I have like all of these markings mm -hmm. on it from like where mm -hmm. that like my hands did that. And uh, I heard this because I was talking about this the other day. I was I think it was like doing a guitar demo, and someone was like, "That's the Segovia rule." I don't know if this is true. Someone just said this to me, mm. but Segovia would give his students the, uh, like a guitar that he was going to play for like a decade and have them wear it in before he would then it would become his guitar. Wow. Huh. Wow. That's amazing. I don't know if it's true. I don't want to start rumors, but someone said that to <laughs> well, me. <laughs> right now it's a great anecdotal story. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. That, that was really great. Um, 
I wanted to maybe um, transition into talking about your your role as an educator. Um, and you know, you mentioned that that came back to just sort of coming out of your network a little bit. But was there was there I, again? I I keep coming back to this idea of like a moment where it clicked, mm-hmm. um, where we you know we kind of do something and we're traveling along on a path, and then suddenly it feels like I need to keep doing that. You know, I, yeah. I want, I want to go there or, you know, with the, the 30 rock line, um, you know, I want to go to there. Um, yeah. What was that moment where you felt like I want to teach people how to play the guitar? Yeah. I, I think like a lot of, I, I struggled with it initially because I think grow before I felt like, co- like competent and confident on my instrument, there was this thing like, Oh, you teach if you can't play, which is right. like, so not true Mm, yeah um and i think i had to like do some maturing before i came to that revelation um but in my 20s like the first part of my 20s i was working at a at a um uh like a music studio and i started an all-girls rock band and i have and it was like really profound to see these girls grow not just as musicians but i could see that just this experience was making them be more confident as people and to have like moments like that with students where i'm like working with people and seeing them evolve and how i mean because i know i'm sure all of us know as musicians when you're evolving on your instrument you're evolving as a human too Mm -hmm. Uh, and how that pairs especially when you're a kid Uh, because we're all looking for like what's our identity how do we fit in and having something like an instrument, even if you're not going to be a professional musician, if you just play it for a year or a month or a week and it like can bring this sense of pride. Um, I think, yeah, so that it's like connecting with students and it happens now where I like watch a student over a semester, a quarter, or a year, or a few years grow. And I was like, it's a pretty powerful thing to know that you're a part of that growth. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So before your job at um LA City, which I definitely want to talk about in a minute. Had you been teaching privately up until then? Yeah. So I was, I only have had one job ever that wasn't related to music. Mm. When I got a car when I was 16 and I was like, I want to make money and save up and like go shopping, <laughs> like whatever I wanted to do. <laughs> and I worked at an event planning place that specialized in balloons. So it's like, <laughs> so for like six months, I worked, I was a balloonatic. I'd like spend my weekends at like, <laughs> like, <laughs> parties and like blow up balloons and decorations and then i was like i I randomly started teaching a couple local kids guitar and instead of making minimum wage which was like seven dollars then or something whatever and uh i was like i charge i forget i think i charged like 20 for a a, i don't remember what i charged but it was like 40 dollars for an hour or something and i was like oh my god i can make so much money do more money doing this so from like 16 and a half on i was teaching um and through that organization freedom for you i used to run improv classes and jazz classes and and then at usc i did outreach i, I taught through outreach and i just like once i started doing it more of it came my way and i think it was like i did a good job and people would recommend me like oh Mo- i know molly teaches why don't you have her here and so yeah that I have always been teaching and yeah, so I've always kind of like straddled these two places of working as an educator while performing. Like while I was at USC during grad school, I was a TA. So I was teaching there alone, like 10 hours. And then outside of that, some weeks, probably 10 hours Mm -hmm. and then gigging like four nights a week, plus rehearsals and practices. It was like insane, Mm -hmm. but it was just like, that's what I did. I like, you know, I, I taught during the day and like when I had a free spot would like probably go to a rehearsal or something. And then most nights I was gigging and like bar gigs for $50 from like 10 AM to 10 PM to 1 AM. Yeah. Wow. It was really fun. I don't know if I could do that right now. Maybe I I (laughs) typically run pretty hot and have a lot of energy, but like, I don't know that that extreme again. sounds like it could get old pretty quickly. It did not get old. I had so much fun. Really? That's the thing. I was like, I remember, it's like, if you love what you do, it doesn't exactly feel like work. Like some days I remember like, I'd be like teaching and I'd be like, oh my God, just keep your eyes open. Don't be, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but, or gigs too. It's like, don't yawn. I had this move where I would like put my hair in front of my face when I had to yawn at like 1245 <laughs> after waking up at like six in the morning or whatever I was doing. Uh, but no, like it, I don't have moments of like, why am I doing this? It was always like so clear why I was doing it. It was all, all of it. Cause I just, I loved it and I still do. And I miss it terribly. Like the, the, I, I mean, yeah, we can get into that. I'm still like doing these things, but 
I don't have, it's like the, as we all know, like our flow is all messed up right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how about in terms of touring? How does that, how does that start to impact your work as an educator, your work in the local, uh, in the local community? Like how does, what, what, what complexity does that add to things? Yeah, I feel fortunate it's worked out. So uh, at LACM, I can miss like up to two weeks per quarter, and then I'll sometimes take a quarter off. So typically I take summers off. I don't know what the future beholds, but mm -hmm. um, so the last few years I've taken summers off because I, I know I'm touring too much in the summer. Mm -hmm. And then it has always a line, knock on wood, um, <laughs> that like it's always a line where it's like my tours line up where they're like over spring break and winter break or whatever, and I only have to miss two weeks of per quarter. Um, and so I've been able to do that. And then in town, I have a couple steady gigs too. And I just, I'll have subs and I'm, mm -hmm. I've like, now I have like a book where I'm like, here's like the book that we use on this gig, just like read these charts and bring in your own or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I've been able, I, I feel really fortunate that it's, it's all lined up and I, I'm sure one day it won't, and then I'll have to kind of sort it out, but I don't, I shouldn't say I'm sure I, I feel fortunate and I hope I can keep riding both of these waves at the same time. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, I think we got a couple of um, viewer questions that, that are, are lining up. I did want to take a quick second. One of our viewers is Luke Walton who asked uh, to say hi. Um, hi, Luke. Uh, yeah, one of our, our marketing managers here at NAM. So um, nice to have those connections. Yeah, we went to school together at USC. Awesome. awesome. Uh, let's see. Our first question comes from Brian. Are you quote unquote brand oriented? Like, will you only play a Fender or a Taylor mm -hmm. or like Brian, a Martin? Um, you know, it, 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 yes and no, because you build relationships. I mean, especially as you guys, like you, you work at NAM, you know, like mm -hmm. I've built a relationship with Taylor. I, um, I just did this big project for them that comes out next month or in like a week. I'm really excited about it. So in one week, I, I feel like I can talk about it, but I shouldn't <laughs> right now. Um, and I've done stuff for them before. And like, I, you know, I know and I've like looked at Andy Powers and played guitar with him and like people on their team I know and love. Um, and I've done stuff with like Fender and Gibson and uh, Equit's guitar right here. Kevin Equit's the guy's like building me a guitar. So it's not like I feel like I'm bound to one, but it is, I do feel loyalty to companies that not like number one, create beautiful instruments, but also that you, you build relationships with, you know, it's like thinking about even a gig, who are you going to call for a gig? Like some random person or someone who mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I love your drumming. And I also really like hanging out with you. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Uh, and then Joe asks, when playing jazz guitar, do you prefer tube amps over digital circuit amps? I always prefer tube amps. Like always but I, I like last week i it kind of messed me up i did a a demo for fender and i played their um what's it, tone master and that was not tube and i was like this sounds really good mm. um because i basically exclusively exclusively use fender combos with tubes um and so it would be nice to not own, to like find guitars where or amps where i don't need tubes because they're more finicky but mm. I don't know. Yeah. So tubes, but with everything, because I, you know, it's like you get used to how the amp feels behind you and how it sounds and how it interacts with your instrument. So, and I, I know how like tube fender combos interact with me and my instrument. Th that leads, that leads me to another question that I just thought of too, in the, in the moment, because I, as a musician myself, I mean, we're all musicians and maybe we've experienced this with, with different people we've worked with, but I noticed that there's there's folks that are very into like you can get the sound from whatever you can get the best sound you can out of an instrument you have on hand. And then there are other musicians who are very tech oriented, very specific oriented, like for lack of better terms, gearheads. And they are very yeah. precise and they are precision focused on exactly what type of uh, their gear they're playing, how they're playing it. We all kind of follow along that spectrum. Where do you kind of see yourself as far as, you know, your how close do you get to your gear and how much do you actually step back and, and, and focus on the music that you're making too? Where do you see yourself? Yeah. I'm probably on like the not gearhead side. Like I have my, my pedal board, I, you know, right here that I love my amp. I love it. I'm, but I'm, I'm not someone who's like, Oh, what's the new thing? I can't wait. Right. I'm just like this reverb pedal. I love, I've like tried a ton and I know like the earthquake or dispatch master. I know how to work it. 
I love the way it sounds. Like, um, so it isn't necessarily, I'm not a super big gearhead. I just, I'm like, oh, this feels good. Oh, this sounds good. Um, and it's much more of like an organic process. Cause sometimes like, you know, the $80,000, like 52 telly doesn't sound or feel as good as like my 52 reissue, you right. know? Mm-hmm. Right, right. Big difference. Big difference. Uh, let's see. Another question from Brian. Have you ever experienced like a, uh, uh, a a writer's block, a music block, a period where you don't feel like you're achieving what you want to achieve? And then how how are you able to break through something like that? Yeah, that's definitely um, it happens. And I feel like I've noticed that those moments happen the most after I've had like a big project I'm working on, whether it's like I'm, I have a record release that I'm like focusing on or like I haven't played with Jason in a while. I'm like, I just got off a of Jason tour. It's like, mm. well, what am I supposed to do with my time now? You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. and there's like those like couple of weeks where you're just like, well, what am I doing again? Um, and I have rituals now and routines and like just kind of like diving into those will help me if I like because, you know, I play my guitar pretty much every single day and especially now I get to like practice every day pretty much. Um, and so I have things I do that are a part of my practice routine, which is like I start, I pick up my instrument, I just connect with it. There's like, you know, at least five minutes of just like uh, connecting. I love this guitar or whatever. And then I'll like, it's like kind of, I like to sight read. That's like the part two of my practicing and then play songs. And um, I'll just play songs for my book of like, you know, I have a bunch of tunes I play and like, and I'll be like, what am I feeling today? Or maybe ahead of time, I'll be like, I want to play these couple songs and I'll like take out a metronome or I like will force projects upon myself. It's like, I'll be like, okay, let's do this transcription. It's like, I was a student for so long that it's really hard for me not to be a student still and give myself assignments of like a transcription, learning new songs. Uh, but yeah, cause I write music too. And that happens more organically where it's not like as much, I'm going to sit down and write a song which is something I'd like to be better at. Um, but Jennifer Condos, who's in my trio, yeah, me, Jen, and Jay Bellarose, um, Jen's good about it. She'll like send me little like voice memos and be like, let's do this song. And then that'll be inspiration for songwriting. Awesome. Awesome. That is awesome. I love, I love the fact that, I mean, you mentioned two things that just really kind of resonated with me. Like when you were talking about how you're, your career and your education experience just kind of organically went from the community that you had created around you, the community that you were a part of and generating. And another thing is that, you know, it's how important it is to persevere and stay in those. I think that's a, it's hard for a lot of us. It's hard to have that kind of dedication sometimes. I don't know what, what blocks uh, a lot of musicians from just do putting in the time and putting in the energy. I mean, there's a, there's a love and a joy for it, but then there's like, Oh, you kind of have to get almost over that mental hump sometimes to be able to say, okay, I need to do this, but I'm, you know, yeah. maybe making it fun or interesting is, is it, we have to find new ways to do that. So those two, those two realities kind of set in, I'm like, wow, you know, that I, I wish I practice more now too. So it's like, I <laughs> yeah, no, do I mean, that. <laughs> we, I still have these struggles all the time where I'm like, I suck. I'm not practicing enough or whatever, but it's funny. I was talking with a student yesterday about this and I was kind of just like, yeah, I feel like 80% of this is mental. You know, it's like or even more. It's Absolutely. just like so much of it is like, just, yeah. I feel like even for me, like guitar lessons were like therapy, you know? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. All right. I think that we've wrapped up some, most of the questions there. There's a couple comments though. Uh, Jade, 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 I apologize if, I, if I'm messing up your name, Jade Ree Tamil. A uh, couple comments. Love watching, listening to Molly play with Jason Mraz. Awesome. Thanks for that comment. And then Jade Ree also says, also love that uh, you helped with the rock and roll camp for girls with Raining Jane. It, can you talk more about that? I'm interested. I don't know this story. Is that something you can comment on? Yeah. So um, when I started working, Raining Jane is there are four girls. It's a ba they're a band and they work with Jason. Um, and also they put on this thing called uh, Rock and Roll Camp for Girls. And it's so cool. Uh, they also have Ladies Rock Camp for awesome. Adult Women. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't matter if you've like never picked up an instrument, you go and it's this really empowering thing to be a part of. And so I've worked as an instructor there and also done uh, like a lunchtime concert. And it's really, really cool for those of you watching, like if you yeah for women and for their and for kids like I, I wish i had something like that when i was 10 or 7 or 
12 or eight. Yeah, it's like eight. I forget the exact ages, but I think it's like seven to, I mean, forever, but seven to like 18 or probably seven to 17 is for the kids and then 18 plus for women's. That sounds super cool. I'm, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I was incorrect because we had one question roll in while you're answering that last one. Okay. I'm, I'm going to fire this one off then too. Okay. So Paul asked, which piece of music was the most difficult for you to master and what was your process in mastering it? Hmm. Oh man, it's like hard to say one. And it, it's funny. I was like, it's always the same process. You sit down and I remember doing this, like I did my uh, doctorate, my lecture recital, the final recital was on pioneering women of the guitar. And I'd studied some like finger picking kind of stuff before, like some Chet atkins stuff. But uh, two of the women who I were studying, one was um, Mother, uh, Mother Mabel Carter doing the Carter scratch and like mm-hmm. trying to figure out that. But Memphis Minnie, she was doing some tunes with like a thumb pick and I hadn't really shed that before. And I remember like starting it and I was like so bad and I just couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And I had a moment like this a few weeks ago trying to do something and I was like, wait, there's no secret to how to do it. You like do one phrase at a time really slowly and then you do the next phrase. Uh, and that's what I was, I, I think about sometimes. It's like, there's no secret to, to any of this. It's mm-hmm. just like you sit down, you go slow and you enjoy it because if you don't enjoy it it's not worth it and so like but yeah so i just really like it's i say the same thing to my students like there's no such thing as practicing too slow if you're not practicing slow you're messing up so like go really slow one phrase at a time and build upon it it's like how you would memorize poetry you know you don't like try to just like read the whole thing 12 times and it's like oh i got it or twelve thousand times you like memorize a line at a time that that struggle is real. Um, <laughs> my personal personal story. It's you know my son is in drumline and he, he plays the multi toms, which I have never touched in my life. He's like, Dad, I need your help on this one part. I'm like, Okay, let's look at it. And I had to like dial it way back. I'm like, Okay, here's our tempo. Yeah. And, and you know they wanted it like 170 or something. Like let's just yeah. let's just step back and tackle this one measure. And it took us, you know however long it took us to get that one measure. But then by the time we got through it, absolutely right, Molly. It was, you know, one step at a time. You know, no matter how hard it is, you, you just break it down into those into those pieces that you can handle and then build up proficiency from there. Amazing. Yeah. I, I hope that's a good, uh, good segue into talking about your role at LACM. Uh, so first, I mean, congratulations on your position as chair uh, of the guitar department. That's pretty huge um for anybody you know watching following along who's maybe not familiar with the workings of a university music department can you tell us a little bit about you know first of all kind of describe lacm's mission modus operandi and then your role as chair of a department um you know what what is your day-to-day like as a teacher at a music college yeah so lacm it's in los angeles actually in pasadena and they started as originally an offshoot of MI, but it, like the idea with LACM is like, not only are you in, in LA, but you're like working with professional musicians and there's a really well-rounded education there where it's not just like you're studying one thing, but you're studying how to become an actual working musician. Hmm. Um, so like a variety of classes from music business and pedagogy, a lot of technique classes, ensembles, um, gen- general ed classes too, because you can get your bachelor's as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my role there is I oversee curriculum. So I like create classes. I uh, created the catalog. That's going to be a new catalog for 2020. Um, I hire and I, I oversee staff and I oversee faculty students too. So if like, and it's a really small college, it's, it's cool. There's like 10, 11 guitar faculty and like there's, you know, like 20, 25 students typically in the guitar mm. department. It's like pretty small. So we all know each other. And that's one of the mm-hmm. really cool things about the program is it's like, I know every student, I know what's going on with them. I know how they're doing. Um, and same with all the other staff too. They know what's going on and who all the students are. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's cool. And I also get a lot of autonomy within the program. When I went in, the main guitar course books were dated and they had some errors in them so i went in and i was like i'm gonna rewrite all the guitar books uh and i did i don't know how i did that but i have like <laughs> my my string five string theory guitar books that are like the fundamentals of guitar that walk you through from like playing your major scales to like cool extended like drop two voicings um 
Yeah, so I, I feel really fortunate to have that that position. When I first applied, and it is part time, which is how I can do everything. And while I don't think it feels necessarily part time all the time, but um, so I teach there, and I and I teach you know a handful of hours a week, and then I I do a lot of emailing and meetings. And I think it, for me, it wasn't it didn't feel that crazy because I went from this sort of insane period during my uh, during grad school where I was like running around playing late gigs like writing big essays going to class teaching it was just like i was already there so like responding to emails and like being on top of things didn't feel that overwhelming sometimes i mean like sometimes i kind of lose my mind and mm. i'm just like what's going on why do i not know how to balance my life um but most of the time i'm just like i feel super fortunate to have the, the job and the position and it's really fun to work with all these students and staff what do you what do you look for in a incoming first year student? Are you looking for, you know, the the top shot, uh, hot shot, top of the, you know, um, the absolute best? Are you looking for somebody who's kind of moldable, who, you know, you can maybe put a stamp on? Is there sort of your an ideal first year student that you're looking for? I mean, I just think it's about someone who wants to grow, and mm -hmm. uh, so like, yeah, they have to be at a certain level, but from that level, it's like. What I want to see is like what I think anyone wants to see is probably someone who like is like there to work hard and loves the thing they do and like shows up excited and and wanting to evolve because this thing we all do is insane and challenging emotionally and like time wise um, it's intense so I think someone who's up for that journey you know mm -hmm. how you know I I just feel like I have to ask you know in light of everything going on right now what what does the curriculum look like right now in 2020? What sort of changes have you had to make? Um, how do you feel like the pedagogical relationship has been affected by things like remote learning or yeah. not being able to be in the same room with your student necessarily? Yeah, and I, it's like different skill sets that I think have been, are able to like flourish more, you know, like students are really great at recording instead of like, mm -hmm being in a classroom and getting to interact with each other. And there's like nothing like that. You know, you can't lie. You can't be like, oh, you're going to get all the same things are going to be happening online because it is like, you're going to lose some stuff. You can't play with a rhythm section in time. But um, all like students are getting so much better with technology, which is a skill set they really need. And as we we all know, like we've all, we all know how to Zoom. We all know how to record ourselves now. We know how to like make videos on our iPhone that are, you can post online and send to each other in the classroom. So there's been a lot of variation with the curriculum like that, with just moving it to, you know, Zoom. Um, so instead of like performing with an ensemble, there's pre-recorded tracks that they'll like send to an ensemble and like like a, a professional bassist and drummer. Mm -hmm. And that will like, you know, make tracks and send to the students and then they, they play it live or they do a lot of recording from home. But it's funny, like, I think... I think I've grown a lot as an educator, especially the first few months of, of quarantine, because uh, you're forced, first of all, to be more creative. Like we all have the thing we do. We walk into the classroom, we walk on stage and it's like, okay, that's the thing I do. Yeah. But you're kind of forced to be like, well, I can't do that thing. So what can I do? Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've had to push myself in different ways and, and like, like, okay, well, how do I get like work on my students tone and how do I like uh make sure they're playing in time and all these things without being in the room with them so I, I do think I've grown as an educator in in that way hmm. yeah definitely a, a an, an adaptability you know we were faced to be adaptable in in this situation and I think um we we did a, an episode a while ago called facing what was it Cri crisis uh -huh. Finding finding things uh -huh. that will will become will will help us grow as artists and and people that will also you know in whatever moments we are facing at the time. So I think a lot of a lot of educators, a lot of artists are are you know finding new ways to engage and finding new strengths out of this whole thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. wild. Yeah. Yeah, it's maybe slightly reductive, but there is this idea that, you know, some of the most amazing art, some of the most amazing culture, some of the most amazing stuff that we as humans do comes out of moments of hardship, hmm. you know, where we we can't do the thing like you're saying, that we, we can't do the thing that we do. Yeah, so yeah. We, we have to come up with a new thing that we do. Um, and so it'll be really interesting in a couple of years, you know, to look back at what's happened and 
and see just how much we've grown and adapted as as living, breathing, culture making humans. I know. Yeah, I really hope that we don't. It's like I I hate th this. I'm like very analog. I hate like I just want to be with people and I but I'm sure yeah. I'm sure <laughs> there will be things like that are really important in our growth. Maybe as simple as like wearing a mask on when you're sick, like mm. not or like not going out when you're sick, you know? <laughs> so it's like, why are you trying to sit in a small room with me if you're coughing? Mm. Speaking of, of growth, um, I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I'm backtracking it just a little bit because when you guys are talking about, um, you know, the students that you were looking for, um, what is what what have you found as maybe some of the harder lessons to impart on some of your students? Like if it's mm. not maybe not a technical lesson, maybe it is technical, maybe it is a, a technical thing or maybe it is a, a career oriented uh, concept that they sometimes it takes a little while, a little longer for some students to get that. Have you experienced uh Anything that you would say is like takes a little longer for for students of guitar or just musicians yeah. in general to 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 grasp. Yeah, there's like two sort of things to that. Like I've definitely, it's I think it's it's never the technical stuff that's that's hard to to like for students to get. It's hmm. the like, I think number one, the emotional stuff can be really hard, especially hmm. being in music school. I make all my students read Effortless Mastery now because I feel like that's a good thing to read when you're going through school talking about like the challenging aspect of like what studying music can do to the self um but i i don't know if it's like the call i feel like i sound so old when i say this but like i'm a millennial i'm like 31 and i'm like oh these these young people like they don't know how to work hard <laughs> like it's like i'm like i think like there's a the, our culture is based upon like oh do this in 10 minutes oh in five like get mm -hmm. great whatever the thing is like whether it's like lose 30 pounds in 30 days or like learn the guitar in one week it's oh, like all yeah. that kind of stuff mm -hmm. that i think people students sometimes forget like there's no secret you just sit there with and like play guitar for a really freaking long time and play with other people a lot of hours and do it it's not like you like magically like get better um, and so I think I said having some hard conversations about that stuff with students where they're like, and I want this big gig. And I'm like, cool, you have to practice a lot. <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, <laughs> like That's awesome that you're excited and you love guitar, but you actually have to work really hard to get good. It's like, it's, it's not hard to be okay. Uh, it's really, you have to spend so many hours. I've, I've shed, and I'm not like, I am not, I have so much work to do, but like, I spent so many hours with this thing and spent, had so many gigs where I left humiliated. And I mean, it's still, I'm sure it's still going to happen. I'll leave a gig and I'll have tears in my eyes. I'm like, why do I, <laughs> whatever. But it's like, you just work really hard. And I, and I find that sometimes, and I don't know if it's like being 10 years younger than me, it's like, they don't get it. Or I just like, I don't know. Yeah. That kind of thing where I've had students who are just like, like think that I think they don't necessarily trust what I'm saying or don't get it yet or they're not mature enough. Cause I'm sure I had that as well, where I was kind of like, you don't get it um, <laughs> when I was on the other side. Right. I, I, I will confess that there are, there are musicians on the other side who are maybe 10 years older than you or, and that still haven't learned that, that lesson either. <laughs> so I'm not going to disclose my age, but you know, it's, I've, I've, I've witnessed it and I do have to, you know, I have to motivate myself sometimes to just keep pushing myself up as well. And that, 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 yeah. that holds true for everybody. I think, and no matter mm -hmm. where you are, just realizing realizing some of those truths is uh it, it it sometimes is hard but you know they are still the truths for a reason you know you got to put in the work to do that that's i didn't i wouldn't have realized that when you said that 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 would be one of those things that you know I mean, obviously after you already stated I'm like oh yeah that makes sense that is that can be a, a tough thing to come to a real grips with if you're expecting yeah. if you have different expectations yeah that's thank like you for the bringing that up number one thing and one other thing actually because yeah. i like i like to tell this story so when someone i studied with at um, usc who's like he's like an uncle to me bruce foreman i'm uh i had a, a guitar lesson with him once and i was like feeling badly about how I sounded on my instrument. I was just like, whatever, like not having, I was like, I went there for the lesson, we're playing and I'm just kind of like throwing it, tossing in the towel or whatever, throwing in the towel, not trying. And he was like pissed at me. He like throws his guitar and he's like, what are you doing, Molly? He's like, don't sit here and waste my time and dishonor what we do. And it's like, every time you pick up your instrument, it is like this beautiful opportunity to make music. Don't like every single note matters. And how dare you like waste my time, mm. waste your time, disrespect the, like, and that was like 
on the other end, like a really important lesson for me mm. to learn. Like, yeah, wow, this is a blessing. Like, mm-hmm. why am I? Yeah. Yeah, I got to I got to study with uh, Tommy Johnson, you know, legendary studio tuba musician when I was at UCLA, you know, did basically, you know, like, I don't know, half, two thirds of all of the major motion sound pic- uh, soundtracks dating back like 40, 50 years. And I had a few lessons where I would show up and it's like, oh, my back hurts. I didn't practice that much. Well, <laughs> oh, I've got this pimple right where my mouthpiece goes, you know, so like, yeah, you know, it's fine. Like, I didn't practice that much. And and he never he never got mad, but there was always just kind of this look on his face yeah. of kind of like, I am bringing so much to the table for you. Hmm. Yeah. And, and this is this is how you're meeting me. Hmm. Um, there's there's a, a level of respect that just has to go both ways. Um, and I think a, a lot of young students really have a hard time or, or it, they, there's a hard lesson there yeah. about hmm. bringing their part to the table. Do you find, I know, right? Do you find that now on the other end as an educator? It's like, we show up and I'm like giving so much. And I'm just, sometimes I'm just like, am I talking? <laughs> What's going on here? Right. Yeah. And you know, it, it is, there's a hard thing with younger kids where maybe it's not necessarily their idea or they're not the ones paying for it. And so they have, they, there's just a little bit less investment on their part. Um, but, but yeah, there's always that moment where it's like, you're doing it for yourself. Um, you know, for sure. I, you know, I've had like the 14 year old kid who, you know, he has to play the tuba to get the scholarship or something, or he has to play tuba to get out of his PE requirement, uh, you know, cause he wants, he wants to take marching band instead of doing volleyball or something. I, you know, that is something that I've known some tuba players to do. And, and for them, it's like, you know, in a way you can kind of forgive it because, because you can tell for them, it's just, it's not, it doesn't mean what it means for you. Um, but there is that switch where it's like you you expect that the student is doing it for themselves, and that suddenly means something very different. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Very sorry interesting. To, sorry to no, go no. off on that. I, 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 I enjoyed it. I agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> I learned so much about tubas on every episode that we do with Jonathan. So. <laughs> I just say the same thing over and over again. So you're obviously not listening. <laughs> oh, the secret is out. Um, I, I, one, one question that I have. Um, when you're like putting putting everything together as a career, especially like what what kind of what kind of advice would you give to somebody who is maybe on the same trajectory? I mean, we, we've kind of gone over the importance of networks and the importance of community, the importance of putting the time in as, a, as an artist and, and honing in on your craft. But are there any other like personal experiences that you've kind of come across that um, you wish you could have told yourself as you were starting off as a, as a younger student with knowing that mm-hmm. you might, might end up on this path? What, what kind of things would you like to impart to that that generation that could be coming up and in, in, in on the same trajectory that you have taken yourself. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a lot of the things people say, you kind of like know they're true, but it's hard to, pers- to do or, but there's a big one is on like leaning into who you are. Cause I think when I stopped trying to be someone else, um, I uh, like my guitar playing. I just got so much better. I was like, and it's like such a vivid time. I was like 25 and I was like, you know, and I was like, you know, you're always afraid on it, especially I think in the jazz culture, there's this like vibing culture that hmm. sometimes can happen. And um, I kind of made this conscious decision. I was like, I don't care if someone vibes me. I don't care if someone doesn't like the way I sound. Hmm. And it's like not that arrogant because I'm we're all painfully insecure and want everyone to love us. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like um, it was this conscious decision where it's like, this is how I sound. This is who I am. And being like... Uh, not being if you play with like a question mark it's not going to sound good you know Mm -hmm. like having uncertainties around that of who you are and how you sound makes you sound worse and just being like like having confidence with wherever you are that moment that day that week is just like digging into that i think is the best thing you can do Mm. and also like not being afraid and i think it kind of ties into the same thing as like i have like one of my mantras like don't be afraid you know like like not being fearful of like sounding bad or people not like it's all this like we all have so much self-doubt and yeah. while the self-doubt is is always going to be there i think once you're doing the thing it's like shedding the fear hmm. yeah 
And I just noticed as, as we were talking about that, Brian brought up another question, um, which I think actually your answer just beautifully answered anyway. How about advice for us older players who still want to succeed musically? And I think everything you just said was relevant to a musician, regardless of where you are on your on your walk with that. Yeah, I do have one more. And like that, <laughs> another one is like jo- joy. That's like I, both my brother and I, that's like a word that I always think about. I remember seeing... Uh, like the Olympic women's team uh, a few years back and they were, I forget what their name was. They had like some name, but Simone Biles was getting interviewed and they were like, don't you get like, and she's like the number one, she's the best. Like, don't you get scared or nervous or like into the competition? And they were like kind of asking her how, if she like freaks out and gets super competitive with all these things. She's like, no, I just love it. Like I just have fun. Mm. And I was like, oh, like it's the same thing with this. It's like, if you just have fun, fun like that's all we're trying to do it doesn't matter if you're like what where you are it's like this is joyous and the more you dig into that the better your art is and the happier human you are for sure i mean even Mm. when you were even when you entertained us briefly with uh your uh your composition i mean i when doing the research every instance of you performing on the guitar i just notice how invested you are into the performance and i'm I, i i think back in the times when i'm performing myself and i'm like I feel like I'm not getting into that situation where I can show my love for playing, but you're, it's obvious. It's obvious every time that you're, you're, you got the guitar in your hand that you're just into that guitar, into the music that's being created. And it's just, it flows out of what you're doing. And I'm like, man, that is the type of creative process that makes me, that inspires me. I'm like, I want to jam. I want to jam along. And I'm like, I want to be that excited about the music I'm playing. (laughs) And then there's there's instances I can think of instances where like I'm I'm playing at a gig and it's like I'm not just it's just you're you're so, so stoic and it's like I I know I'm not feeling it and I know that yeah. it translates to the people around me and then it translates to the the listener too and it's just like when you, it's just you can see that that when you have that pure love and that you recognize that it's an integral part of what you're doing I'm like oh just seeing you play, I'm like, that makes so much sense. Where, 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 where <laughs> I, I, yeah. I got to make that happen. I got to make that happen. I just don't post the videos. For it, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's what but, you don't see. No, but I, I, it was actually, I did this thing a couple of years ago. I started, I mean, 2020, I'm not doing it. But like the last couple of years, I do a, a gig journal where after every single gig, I write down a couple notes about it. Like anything like what happened if there was a moment that was good a moment that was bad Hmm. um a song that i messed up and it could be any like it's not always just like negative things it was really consciously like this is not going to be a place where i just say i suck where sometimes i do but i try to be actually constructive and sometimes i would like come back from a gig and have nothing to say from it about it and i was like that's i never want that to happen Hmm. um and so i did like i'll also consciously make a shift if i'd ever come back from a gig without like this is how I felt. This is what happened. I was like, wait, I have nothing to say. That's horrible. Like Mm. I wasn't present. So it is like, I always want to be present when I'm making music. It's just (laughs) like, especially now, God, the gratitude I have for like every time I get to play my instrument with other people and alone. But yeah. Yeah, for sure. Amazing. Um, Well, I just want to ask along, along those lines, you know, speaking of 2020, and and looking ahead to 2021. um, So I know that your, your trio is releasing an album um so congratulations on that that's pretty huge um where you know where do you see yourself going what are the areas you want to be growing into you know what what is your performing career looking like you know in in the best world moving forward you know what does that look like um what, what are you working on what are you hoping for yeah i mean i feel fortunate i always say like i love everything i do right now and i just want to keep evolving within it like my trio with jen and jay is something that means so much to me and like so i love that side of like getting to write and work on music for my group and i want to tour that record and i don't know what touring is going to look like but i want i want people to hear the record i'm so proud of it uh, but also like i love being a side man as well i know i need the mixture i don't want to mm-hmm. just do one thing like i love being able to like have my gig that i work for and then like also play with a bunch of like 
incredible artist. Like I get not only Jason, but just like people in town and random artists that'll hit me up like, hey, can you do this gig in Florida next week? I'm like, sure. Like I I think it all, and the in-town stuff. I love playing in town. Like I love, I love teaching. Just, I think for me, it's like the variety of things, but continuing to evolve within that where I just like, you know, get to play for more people and more people hear my music. And, uh, but it's really like about just, I always say like, playing meaningful music with people that inspire me and evolving. And if I'm doing that, like I'm, uh, so I feel super fortunate and I feel like I've been able to do that. And so I just hope I can continue to do that. Hmm. Awesome. And if any of our viewers are looking to check out that record, check out some of your music, how might they go about that? I know it was supposed to come out a couple months ago and now we're <laughs> waiting. I think it'll be spring 2021. It's just sitting there. My, my, oh. uh, vinyl, like the test pressings actually just arrived yesterday. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, so you can follow me. Like I'm pretty good about Instagram, like updating what's going on. So I'm at Moody Mill, M-O-O-D-Y-M-I-L-L. Um, my website, Molly Miller Music. I do, uh, yeah, I feel like on those two platforms, if you if you follow me on there, then you'll, you'll kind of know what's going on. I have like a YouTube channel, like all that kind of social media stuff. Uh, yeah, so if you follow me there, and if you can always email me and ask me questions, it's that all that stuff's there. What's going on? But yeah, I just want to play music. That's what <laughs> I like to do. Awesome. And well, speaking, I mean, I think we have we actually have uh, links to your Instagram and your YouTube and your website on our on the episode description here on cool. on Facebook and both uh, at the Museum of Making Music's uh, website. Speaking of playing music, would would you be open to maybe one more song? We're at the top of the hour right now, so this yeah. might be a perfect opportunity to to kind of uh, bookend it with some, just some of your playing again. It was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I have to decide what do you guys want to hear? What do you want to hear? Another... Uh... Dealer's, dealer's choice. Okay, I'll do this, because I, I just because I, I played it yesterday. <laughs> right, what's today? I don't even know what today is. I don't know what day of the week it is. Um, Friday. It's still, Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, here's a little ditty. I do. I I did uh, this thing. Pick up music. They're fun, and I I wrote a song squad is what it's called. So I'll play that little song squad, and I'll improvise uh, this on it too. so good that's so good all right dr molly miller thank you so much for joining us today dr jonathan piper thank you for leading the conversation i um again every single episode i am just inspired uh by by our guests uh i appreciate them so much uh let's see on the horizon we're past the top of the hour thank you to our audience for joining us today wonderful questions uh let's see what's in our future for mom at home next week next week next friday is a friday october 2nd that's coming up to we're coming up to halloween already geez louise i can't believe it um we have 
We have Lee Anderton, uh, general manager for Anderton's Music out of England, will be joining us next week to talk about uh, innovating in the music store, uh, something we don't often consider, but something that does happen. So he's uh, built up quite an internet brand presence with their own videos uh, of guitar demonstrations and all kinds of cool stuff that they do at Anderton's Music. So we'll be talking to him next week. Uh, also, next Friday, we have our Live at Mom virtual concert series with uh, Curtis Taylor and his group. So he will be coming from us from Detroit. We're going to be not live exactly at the museum. We'll be presenting him live, but he'll also be presenting his music with his trio that he's done. So join us for that. The following week, following Friday, October 9th, we have accordions. Yes, shifting from two weeks of guitars to accordions because that's what we do. Anyway, we have Creosote coming to us, Jamie Mashler and Gabriel Rodriguez Hall, or Hall Rodriguez, I'm probably doing that backwards, but uh, Jamie and Gabriel, we've had them, we featured them during our accordion exhibit, um, and they are wonderful. Uh, they will be sharing the wide variety of possibilities with the accordion, and then following that, I, I my mind is a blank, but I know that we have a full, full schedule uh, that you can check out online at www.museumofmakingmusic.org. We hope to see you in the future at our next Mom at Home episode. One more big thank you to Dr. Molly and Jonathan for joining us today. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. I am inspired to go and practice now and become a better musician of, because of this episode. Everyone else out there, thank you again. Take care, and we will see you next time.